Hello, mm. everyone. I can't believe we are already at the end. Uh, well, not quite, but almost. All right, we'll let our our, uh, our panelists trickle in here. Um, as we had uh, uh, mentioned before, if you uh, have some, we've got some questions that people have uh, emailed. We'll take take some of those uh, as we can, combine them. You know, when they're when they're similar. Uh, if you if you have some burning questions still, um, we'll go ahead and, and email them to events at hildebrandproject.org, and we can see if we can we can fit them in. Um, I think particularly we're working looking for questions that bring together a variety of talks and topics uh, throughout the week um, to uh, address our many panelists, perhaps try to synthesize uh, what we've been talking about this week. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take some questions um, at the beginning and then um, towards the end, we're gonna move to a kind of closing statements section in which we'll invite our panelists to articulate in two minutes what they think is the personalist vision. Um, so let us see who all we have. Everyone here. So Rocco and Joseph and Mark and Mark and Dave Walsh, hello. Uh, John Henry, you're joining us, yes? Uh, I guess we'll be right, right back. And then I think we're waiting for John Crosby. Should be joining us as well. So we'll just give a couple minutes. Uh, feel free also to use the QA uh, section here and we'll try. Christopher, I'll be with you in just a moment. Yes. And so we'll. All right. so Here, here's here's an easy one for you, uh, Mark. While we're while we're waiting, someone in the chat is asking for a book recommendation for a book by Soloveitchik. So you're muted. You're, you you are muted, Mark. I yes. Think I have the power Apologies. to unmute you. Okay. So the the one volume that I'd recommend for all those interested in Soloveitchik is a <clears throat> it's an essay that has now been made into a monograph called The Lonely Man of Faith that was published in 1965 and it's it's a kind of Jewish precursor to John Paul II's Wednesday audiences because what it does is it looks carefully at Genesis 1 and 2 and creates a typology of man uh, based on the differing creation accounts, the creation account in Genesis 1 and the creation account in Genesis 2, eschewing uh, historical critical approaches uh, and offering a theological anthropology. What's particularly significant about this volume for Christian readers is that the original lecture that the book and the essay was based on was a talk given to St. Joseph's Seminary in Brighton, Massachusetts, just out, uh, just it's part of Boston, actually. Um, so it's Rabbi Soloveitchik giving a, a Jewishly inflected universal account of man uh, delivered originally to uh, seminarians uh, in, in Brighton, Massachusetts. So it's, it's accessible and will be very, very understandable and appreciated by Christian readers as well as um, men and women of, of personalist inclinations. The Lonely Man of Faith. Thanks, Mark. I think I need to pick that up myself. Nice. All righty. So we are, we are here together. <laughs> yeah. So this is how we're solving some technical problems. It's just 
being on the, being on the just like the zoom equivalent of breaking the fourth wall i'm not there are two people in one screen yes uh, that's a, <laughs> good that's great yes my my connection didn't didn't work and so we decided to share the same screen yeah. okay and uh, i see michael's with us his video is not on right now all right hopefully you're with us are you are you here michael have you, have you broken something else michael is here but i think has also other oh, okay there we go <clears throat> i am here Thank you. So, no, I have not broken everything. But I, I, re, I always, I, I told John Henry, I re, was reminded of the time when Dr. Crosby was so upset at what Father Stanley Yaki said, he crashed his car. And so now that I was so excited of what Professor Buttiglione said that I broke my computer, I feel I have entered into a, a new state of being. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Christopher, there yeah. is. Marguerite mm -hmm. Rudy will join us uh, a little bit late. So I think we should get things underway here. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, well, I'm going to um, <clears throat> well, first welcome you all and thank you for, for being with us this week. Um, and we're delighted to have so many of our panelists for this last session in which we're going to ask the very, very hardest questions and uh, have an adequate time to answer them uh, satisfactorily. So that's that's the plan from, from the get go. Um, but uh, <clears throat> But I'm going to go ahead and dive in and exercise my, my prerogative here as the, as the moderator uh, to ask, uh, ask a question that's occurred to me throughout the week. Um, some of you, uh, our, our panelists, have, have referred to the anthropological crisis of our age. Uh, some people call this, have called this the John Paul II project, responding to this anthropological crisis. Um, but there are those uh, today who would say that the JP2 project has failed um, or is perhaps unnecessary because what we really face today is a metaphysical crisis. I don't want to suggest that those are in any way opposed. I don't think that, that they are. But I wonder if any of our panelists could explain why the crisis of our age presently is best understood as an anthropological crisis of the human person. <laughs> so Christopher, you're posing this to, to anyone on the panel at this point who would like to. I'm, I'm, I'm posing this to, to anyone, um, but uh, I'll call on people if people don't chime in. I mean, I can go ahead and tell you, Rocco, that I'm going to call on you if you don't chime in. I call you on Rocco. Yeah. Okay. And Joseph as well, because this came up in his talk. I know. Yeah, I, I particularly want to hear from you guys. And Mark, I see you sitting there. You look like you have an answer. Well, uh, I would say um, we already had an anthropological, um, excuse me, um, uh, a metaphysical crisis. Uh, I remember an article of uh, Josef Tischner many years ago on um, the end of the Thomist uh, stage in the history of Catholic philosophy. And it was based exactly on this point. Um, the basis of uh, metaphysics are questioned. And they are questioned uh, because uh, uh, we uh, well, take uh, the first assumption of St. Thomas, asset bonum convertuntur, being is good. The people are no more convinced that being is good. You have to revive in them the experience of being as good. And you can do this only going through the heart of man. You must enter into a dialogue with the person, bring the, the person back to its interiority. And in its interiority, in her interiority or his interiority, the person will find um, again the first metaphysical principles. But until you do this, you cannot begin until being has become uh, again the expression of uh, something beautiful that you have discovered in yourself. So uh, we must go back to St. Augustine, in te ipsum redi, go back to yourself. And philo the philosopher has the task of uh, accompanying people to the rediscovery of uh, the inner self and of the beauty of being 
in the inner self and through the inner self. I think this was to a large extent also the teaching of Wojtyla. I don't know what uh, is meant with uh, um, the uh, GP2 um, program, but I think this program is first of all the program of going back to the person and helping the person to find uh, the roots. And the exterior master, uh, the philosopher, uh, the, psych the psychologist, uh, uh, is, uh, has the function of reviving the inner master. And you can do that if you are in a close connection with the, the interior master. And the interior master is the logos of God. And here, personalism enters in touch with the theology because this logos of God has become uh, apparent in human history in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Rocco. Uh, would anyone else like to respond, Joseph? Well, uh, I think uh, the, the ecological crisis and the anthropological crisis uh, are on a completely different order. I think the ecological crisis is, well, uh, nobody knows exactly what the ecological crisis is, but anyway, if it no, is what being discussed is the metaphysical crisis, not the oh. ecological crisis. Uh, not the ecological crisis. Ah, I'm sorry. I thought Thank the... <laughs> okay, I misunderstood. Yeah, why? Well, so yeah, why? Why? Why is our present crisis best understood as an anthropological crisis of the human person, as opposed to, for instance, a metaphysical crisis? As, a, as opposed to a metaphysical crisis. Well, uh, I think. Uh, an anthropological and a metaphysical crisis are very closely related. And of course, you never, the question is, what do you mean by, by anthropological and metaphysical crisis? Uh, is it a crisis of metaphysics and of anthropology, of the understanding of man? There's a huge crisis because materialism and all kinds of determinism and of all kinds of false ideas about man constitute a huge crisis. There are very few anthropologists who say the truth about man. Therefore, anthropology is in deep crisis and so is metaphysics. But if you mean the, the metaphysical anthropological crisis, so to speak, as the crisis of the concrete human beings, not of the science of metaphysics and anthropology, then well, you can say that this crisis both of these crises uh, are very real. The man somehow loses, many men, maybe the majority, loses his understanding of the metaphysical situation of man, of, of the ultimate position he has in the whole of reality in relation to God, in relation to other persons, in relation to nature. And so in that sense, we can speak of an anthropological crisis of, of the human, of a very large portion of human beings losing their understanding of their uh, dignity, of their being, of their value, and of their true mission. And they put health or wealth uh, much higher than, than moral goodness or than religious uh, dimensions of human existence. And so in that sense, you can say that not the science of anthropology, which is in, in constant deep crisis with the whole subjectivism in modern philosophy since Kant particularly and since Hume and mm -hmm. I mean, countless others. But when you speak of the crisis, so to speak, of the concrete human persons who are not philosophers or not, not thinkers who do not teach uh, philosophical anthropology, then I think there's a deep crisis in, in countless persons, human persons, who, who do not anymore stand the true nature of man. And there's a metaphysical crisis of concrete human individuals in that they do not understand not only their own human nature and their call and their, their highest goods and highest values whose realization they are called, but they do not also understand their metaphysical place, their relationship to the absolute being, to the divine being. And so 
I would say, yeah, I would say there is a double crisis, a metaphysical and anthropological crisis in the self-understanding and in the understanding of human beings themselves and of understanding each other. I mean, they treat each other in a way that neither does justice to their full nature and dignity of persons, nor to their place in the whole of being. And so, for example, the transhumanism or many other tendencies, they constitute, have their effect on, on, on concrete human individuals which live in a, more than in a crisis, they live in an abyss of, of metaphysical and anthropological errors. Christopher, may I join for a second? Like to... Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, this is Michael. I would, I'd like to join in for just very quickly. I think that both Rocco and Joseph have been very articulate this. And I, I want to, so I'm going to be a little bit provocative. And I would say, and I'm happy to be corrected, but it seems that that is, I don't even, I don't understand what that sentence means. It seems like it's a false dichotomy. I think Rock was exactly right that we are in a crisis of being. We don't understand that being is good and we don't understand who we are. And so it, those type of sentences seems to me like, well, the John Paul project is done. It's really metaphysics. It seems to me like a clever kind of Twitter slogan that we can get a lot of people saying, yay, yay about. Um, but it, but I was very kind of delighted to hear both uh, 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 Professor Seibert and Professor Bittiglione like take the question seriously and say, well, you know, we're in an ontological a crisis about being, the being is good. And we're in a crisis about what it means to be a human person. And these are interrelated. Um, and uh, whether being is good is a fundamental question because if being is good and matter is good, and the person is good and embodied persons are good those <clears throat> that's an, that's an anthropological and a metaphysical um uh, question and so i i just to be provocative i just think it's kind of a silly statement that as i said is appropriate to getting twitter followers and likes but isn't really a serious philosophical position what is the silly but i'm statement? happy to be told why i'm wrong You'll have no objection from me. I see Mark, uh, well, both Marks have something to say here. Um, uh, Mark, Mark Spencer, I saw your, your hand up first. We'll start with you and then uh, Rabbi Mark afterwards. Okay, um, so I also, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, everything Rocco and Joseph and, and, and Michael uh, just said. I think trying to separate these things are, is, it, it's an equal crisis uh, sort of either way. But here's maybe a reason why, you know, sort of uh, when we talk about these things as personalists, it might be better to talk about an anthropological rather than a metaphysical crisis. Or what, one reason why that might be a better way of framing things. Um, when we talk about metaphysics, of course, we're talking about uh, an account of, of being as such, of the whole of being. Uh, and there's a sense in which uh, talking about metaphysics has tended to be reductionistic over the last few centuries, say ever since, I don't know, Hegel or somebody. Um, that is, uh, we come to see the human person purely in terms of their, uh, their sort of place in, in this larger being, and they become reduced to some, some larger system. We see this, for example, in Heidegger, I think, in which uh, ultimately what's important is being, right? Uh, existence maybe on, on, on some interpretations, but not the, the particular individual, unique, irreducible human being. We see it also in the determinisms that, that Joseph talked about in which I am reduced to uh, merely a part of material being. And so there might be a, a, a temptation, a tendency some people have if we frame it primarily in terms of a metaphysical crisis uh, to think of the human person merely as a part of something else, something larger right? being, even if that being is framed as, as good. Whereas if we frame it as an anthropological crisis, we're really putting the emphasis on the, the human person. Um, of course, we need to frame that in a way where it's not separated from being conceived of as good and, and, and all the rest. Um, but we're squarely putting the emphasis on human persons. Thanks. Um, Rabbi Mark and then David, you also have a response. Rocco. It just quickly, I think we can all agree that 
at its core, any anthropological problem is a metaphysical problem. Any anthropological crisis is at its very you know, core and its being in its essence a metaphysical one. The, the reason why I might prioritize the anthropological crisis is that from a perspective of mission and vocation and audience and tactics, the anthropological one is more acute because we speak to a world that is far more you know, enmeshed, far more entangled in anthropological questions than metaphysical questions. In other words, if we have an ambition as a community, as a, a personalist um, community or, or uh, a sense of purpose and, and mission and vocation as a community of the faithful, then we have to take into account our audience. Um, there, there is, you know, there is no God without a people in, in the Jewish tradition, that idea that there, of course, metaphysically, that's not true. God exists independent of, of any creation. That's by definition, you know, a, a, an essential understanding of God, the only necessary being. But from a point of view of, of tactics and strategy, we need to take into account the audience of modern life and the audience of our contemporary culture. And that's an audience that's far more interested in anthropological questions than metaphysical ones, at least on the surface. So that's why I would prioritize the anthropological because that's that's the language and those are the gestures that our brothers and sisters, either of the faith or even outside of our immediate community are desperate to, uh, to be spoken to in those terms. Thanks, uh, I think David and Rocco and Jim, I will ask everyone, um, try, try to keep our, our answers brief just because we have so many people and I don't want to take up the whole session on this one question, important as, and interesting as it is. Uh, David. Okay, well, I think we, we probably could uh, spend the whole session on this one. Fair enough. <laughs> but uh, but I'm, I'm not sure that this is the best way into it. <laughs> um, uh, what, I mean, uh, even this terminology of uh, anthropological or, or, or metaphysical crisis, for us, that's a shorthand uh, that means a lot of things. Uh, but it's not really necessarily transparent to the wider uh, audience or, or to people that we want to reach. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, reminded of, of the, the last session uh, where Ann, Ann Snyder uh, gave that wonderful description of the, uh, the other side moving company and all, and all the ways in which they had gone about sort of a practical transformation of their lives through the, the, the sheer um, spiritual energy of interpersonal relationships. Okay, uh, now none of, none of, nobody there referred to about an anthropological crisis or the metaphysical dimensions of what they were doing. So in fact, the world is solving these problems um, before the philosophers can really uh, agree on it. Uh, and, and that's fine. That's, na that's natural. That's the way it is. But um, what, what I would uh, and say, well, then what, what's the role of philosophers? The, the role of philosophers is really to suggest a <coughs> paradigm. A paradigm. <coughs> uh, and really, uh, you know, the practical world goes on, the lived world goes on, people carry on with their lives, they solve their own problems and they address them and they make things better in many cases. Uh, what they don't have is a kind of vision or a paradigm or a way of understanding things, a worldview that makes sense of it all and that can explain how does this you know, stack up against the sort of totally instrumentalized and utilitarian world it, that we inhabit where you could say scientific objectivity is the only authoritative form of knowledge. Uh, we, we just need ways of affirming and confirming the deep spiritual impulses that are really out there and still vibrant. That's a very important addition. Uh, Jim, and then we'll let Rocco have the last word. I, well, I was thinking of um, the GP2 program. It was not a metaphysical program. There is a wonderful booklet of um, uh, Karol Wojtyła, Tadeusz Stichen, and Andrzej Shostek with the title, uh, The Controversy on Man. And it, it, is, it clearly, we must recover being, but we must find again the evidence of being in man. And this is the task of phenomenology. 
because the crisis to a large extent arises out of a division between the perception of being and the perception of value. And I think the great force of uh, on Hildebrand and, and on, of Wojtyla consists exactly in setting the starting point in the heart of man. The heart of man is the center of cognition, but also of evaluation. Whenever we know, at the same time, we evaluate. And the perception of being and the perception of value are connected with one another. But in order to see this, you must to go back to the heart of man. And that is the point. If you do this, then all other things come as a consequence. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I know we have a lot more to say on this, uh, and uh, I hope we can continue this, this conversation. Um, but uh, we'll move on to <clears throat> our, our closing statements here, just because I, I want to make sure we have time for all of them, uh, and so we can have some discussion about them as well. Um, so this this seminar has been billed as the personalist vision, and our descriptions. Uh, and analysis for it, we we promised that we would we would bring together these you know some of these various strands of of personalism uh, to provide a comprehensive uh, vision um, of personalist philosophy and the human person. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to evaluate us on how well we've done on that, but uh, I, I would uh, like for each of our panelists to comment uh, in just a couple minutes um, on what they. How they would describe the personalist vision? Um, we'll just we'll we'll start at my my top here uh, and start with Mark Spencer. Thanks, Christopher. Um, how would I describe the personalist vision? Um, so I want to go back to the first, the very first session when John Crosby and I spoke, and we we talked about uh, the unrepeatability of persons and the the irreducibility of persons, that each person is, is radically unique and that persons cannot be uh, reduced or said to be nothing but uh, something non-personal. Uh, Joseph has talked about this uh, in numerous sessions as, as persons as the, the highest uh, and, and most primary sense of being. Uh, so I, I think that the, the personalist vision is a vision of of persons of the world that is guided fundamentally by that conviction. <laughs> and I wanna put a lot of emphasis on that word vision. Uh, that is, this is not supposed to be an abstract philosophical doctrine. Uh, it is supposed to be a, an account of persons and an account of the world that really guides the way that we see things. Uh, our perception of the world is not just sort of naive and, and we just see sort of what shows up. Our perception of things are guided by the, the concepts and the propositions that we accept. And so the personalist vision is one in which we have really internalized uh, this conviction that persons are unrepeatable and irreducible and we come to genuinely see them uh, in that way uh, without having to think about it, so to speak. And that informs all of our actions. And I think that's what we've been doing this week. We could see this week as a sort of training in that perception, a training in that vision. Uh, by talking about these things and by hashing out ideas about persons, uh, we hopefully have all come to be able to genuinely see other persons as persons in this radically irreducible sense, which enables us to do the sorts of activities that, that people like Ann Snyder talked about. Uh, that's what I see as the, the personalist vision. Thank you. Joseph, thank you next. Am I next? <laughs> yes, you, you are next, if, if you would. Uh, I think the, the, if we speak of personalist vision uh, of the core of, of the personalist uh, thought and life, uh, of course, one could see it more like Mark Spencer apparently sees it as as not as a philosophical personalism, but as a vision, a concrete vision that guides our action or life, and that uh, is uh, not any kind of abstract philosophy. 
But I think this personalization that that uh, Mark speaks of and that perhaps is the is 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 the main concrete uh, applicable uh, understanding of personalism is nevertheless founded on a philosophical personal vision. And that uh, philosophical personal vision, I think, has a number of key elements if it is a true personalist vision, as I distinguished the false to wrong personalism or pseudo personalism. And uh, I think uh, it, it, well, it implies that we understand that unique uh, dignity and value and superiority that the person possesses an undeserved superiority. When I talk to my dog, I always tell her that I have no merit at all to be a person and not a dog, and that both of us are created and dependent on the divine creation. But nevertheless, God endowed the person, or we are endowed with that uh, faculty, with those faculties which constitute the personhood, the, the intellect, the free will, and thereby the ability to act uh, the, the good or the evil, the, the heart, the, the spiritual forms of human activity. Uh, and so I think uh, we, the, the philosophical person implies that we understand the essence of the person, what distinguishes persons from animals, uh, that we understand that we are not like a like a further developed ape or monkey or um, an animal that is just a little bigger brain, but that we are a person that means also that we have a spiritual soul. A person is a spiritual, substantial entity, individual, substantial, rationalist, natural, as Boethius and St. Thomas say. And, um, and even if that's not exhaustive, uh, description of person uh, is also an important part of it. And, and of course, the relation, the whole to community, uh, the family of, of human society, human states, of somebody and so on, and the community of saints, the heavenly goal of the, the community of the personal life itself. And uh, I think um, in Apart from this anthropological um, vision of the uniqueness and dignity, like this irreplaceable, absolute uniqueness and irreplaceability of each person, and what Mark and, and John Crosby emphasized so much in Tunskotus, my blessed Tunskotus, <laughs> so we have also the the ethical dimension of this person's vision. And I think that is most profoundly uh, implied in this Voitivian way of reinterpreting Kant, uh, that we should affirm and love the person for her own sake. As Oma Amanda et Afirmanda est Optas And that, of course, does not mean that we should not from human persons also, and even primarily for the sake of God, but it means that really each person, including the human person, deserves a love for the sake of his intrinsic value, dignity, and importance, and not only for somebody else. So this ethical personalism, persona Amanda is put as Ipsam, is, I think, a crucial element the person's vision. And then the metaphysical dimension of the person's vision, I think, is precisely, and I do not quite agree with the rabbi, <laughs> that, that we should direct uh, the question to those questions which most men are occupied with. And we should, so to speak, not also treat with questions, ultimate questions, which, uh, which many people do not care about, but which we still include in our post vision. And so I think that the contingency, the limitation of the human person, the fact that he is called to the, to, to the love of God 
of all other things to to raise his mind to the absolute person uh, is a crucial a crucial part of the personal vision and if we lock the person into the, the mere humanity we have something like atheist humanism that the Libak uh, analyzed very deeply or Michelli in his critique of uh, Merleau-Ponty and we have a kind of personalism that that is cut off its ultimate goal, its ultimate end, its ultimate uh, fulfillment. And uh, also, so to speak, there's no foundation of, of a transcendent, immortal or eternal life if you cut the process completely off um, the metaphysical relationship it, it has to the absolute divine being. And from that point of view, also, I think if we do not overcome the kind of uh, evolutionist uh, view of man, I just wrote this book by, by Dawkins and Darwin. Uh, and if we don't uh, overcome this idea that the person is caused by natural causes, by the Big Bang ultimately, then we completely forget also the anthropological aspect of the anthropological vision. Without the metaphysical, so to speak, background of the ultimate origin and end of man um, and his relationship to God, both in his origin and in his final destination, I think we have a very kind of truncated personalism that may have many deep intuitions and many good points, and, and uh, whatever, like Camus or, uh, but which lacks somehow the ultimate foundation. And of course, if you speak of a Christian person's vision, then the, 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 the personhood of God in the, in the triunity and community of the three perfect persons, which are one thing in God. And of course, in the God man uh, who embodies both the divine person and the human nature into one. Uh, being and the redeemer and the object of our love and of our service. And so I think the elements of the Christian personalist vision, which also are not shared by the Jewish uh, personalism, which of course shares many things with us and many also metaphysical Thank you, Joseph. Uh, I, I know that, that you have more to say, and I would like to hear it, and I'm sure the rest of our participants would as well. But we're, we're running a little bit low on time, and I want to hear uh, still from the rest of our panelists. Um, yeah. So uh, we're going to uh, move on on, the, on, <laughs> on that segue uh, to, to Rabbi Mark. And um, in, in answering this question of what is the personalist vision, um, let me let me ask and invite you all to try to articulate like one one thing, and I know there's more than one thing, but perhaps with all of us, we'll get, you know, the many one one things uh, that that to you is really at the heart of uh, the personalist vision. And uh, we'll try to keep our answers to just a couple couple of minutes. Thanks, Rabbi. Sure. So, the personalist vision that that I most identify is is grounded in the biblical ideal of man being created in God's image. And is expressed in a more homey and and more um, anthropological fashion in the principle that the closest that we get to God in this world is the human face of another. Now I don't know if that would pass muster from a Eucharistic point of view, but from a Jewish, you know, theological anthropology, the idea that the face of the human other is in the deepest sense, an expression of the divine. Now, when I say that, I don't mean it in the Buberian limited fashion of just acknowledging the radical subjectivity of the other human person. But for me, as a halakhic Jew, as an Orthodox Jew, what that embodiment in the human person points towards is that the human being is fully realized in the habits, the behaviors, the communities, the local and, and broader um, peoplehood that that the, the Jewish man or woman um, sees in his or her day-to-day day -day life. It has to be embodied in the concrete practices, the commandments for an Orthodox Jew, but also in the relationships between others, 
the family being the the first you know the first society the first community the first political <laughs> order um so it's the human face of the other as an animating spirit and it's the concrete practices habits um songs symbols uh incarnational life that we all live and and for me as a jew i get a lot of nourishment out of the little essay the weight of glory by c.s lewis who i think should be included in some ways in the personalist canon at least if not for his broader um orientation but at the very least for this line where as many of you probably know this that when you meet the green grocer or the the postman you're not just meeting a mere human being you're meeting a creature that an, in other conditions you would be tempted to adore uh or venerate because you're really getting the essence of 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 the divine in that human being so i i i take that line of lewis very seriously and and it's something that for an orthodox jew it is chiefly embodied in the human person but then extends outward to the behaviors to the to the body to the body's actions to the concrete performances rituals symbols commandments um so that's in brief my personalist credo Thank you, Mark. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through everyone on this, but I see uh, Jim has his hand raised here. So we'll, we'll go to Jim next. Hi, thanks, Chris. Uh, uh, I, I, I will now leave because I have another appointment. It's, I'm not offended because Christopher cut me short, <laughs> nor am I in any way disagreeing with Rabbi to the beautiful, on this beautiful explanation of the personalist vision. And nor do I uh, lack great interest in all your other speeches, but I will have to leave now, so uh, so that you understand it as an inoffensive leaving. Well, thank thank you very much for joining us all this this week, Joseph. It's always a special treat. Uh, Enjoy your new uh, seeing you, Joseph. Uh, the same here. My turn, Chris. Uh, okay. Yes, back to you, Jim. Okay, I'm going to try to sum up all that I have heard this week. I've been in all the conferences and kind of how I would answer that question um, with one statement and with one question. Um, what is the personalist vision? I think that the personalist vision for our age is the question of human dignity, how we see persons, and uh, that vision is both our way of seeing and our vocation. That I think leads to a central question. How do we see in terms of the personal's vision and how do we treat the very old, the very young, and the very vulnerable? To the extent that we can provide a cogent answer to that question, both in thought and in action, we are seeding the entire culture with the personal's vision. And that I think is one of our central vocations for this age. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, David, you ready? Right, let me unmute you here. I can't unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. All right. Yeah. There we go. Sure. Um, well, you know, in, uh, following up on on Jim's observation there, and and also on Mark, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, this has been a wonderful week, and uh, you know, uh, it, one of the one of the um, uh, characteristics of persons is that. Um, even though they can think independently and even write independently, they can't really affirm the reality of any of that until other persons affirm it for them. Uh, so there is a, a real kind of sense in which uh, it's only by coming together that we really gain a grip on what we mean by the person or personalism or the, or the, the you could say the, um, the absolutely precious reality of persons who are, of course, invisible entirely to us and uh, impenetrable even to ourselves. As St. Augustine says, there is a depth in each, in each man that's so deep as to be hidden from himself. Uh, you know, that's, that's the reality. And so it is an elusive thing that we're talking about. And uh, I can say that uh, 
uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, uh, joining this uh, support group for persons. Uh, <laughs> Because in essence, that, that's what I think we've been doing. Uh, you know, we're all persons. Uh, and uh, the one thing that we forget most of all is that uh, we and the, other, the others that we interact with on a, a regular and daily basis are persons. And that's, of course, uh, the big reminder that everyone needs. And of course, it's what's utterly absent from the self-understanding of the world that we inhabit. No, nowhere in it are we reminded uh, that we are persons or valued even as persons. When you go to work, you're valued for what you can produce. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know that it's a, it's, it, we, we live in these dichotomous wor worlds. And I'll just leave you with uh, uh, the last line from a poem by Seamus Heaney. It's called Postscript, if anybody wants to look at it. You'll find it on the internet, as everything is. Uh, the last line of the poem says, catch the heart off guard and blow it open. Catch the heart off guard and blow it open. I think that's that's as good a statement of the personalist project as any. Thank you, David. We now need, I think we need to add a personalist support group to our uh, mission statement. Uh, <laughs> uh, Pete, we haven't heard from you yet. All right, thank you. Well, I agree with everyone. This week has been hi, Rocco. <laughs> this week has been uh, has been really wonderful, and um, it's been like a school, like Mark said, of personalism. And I guess the contribution I would say that personalism brings, or the vision it brings, is um, John Paul used to talk about the truth about the good and the goodness of the truth. And I think this preciousness of the person, when connected to morality gives people hearing it for the first time an actual way to understand the reasons behind traditional morality in such a way that they see living according to it will be a source of profound happiness. And then they have a real reason, not just because it's a moral law, but to live according to the different traditional moral teachings or many of the teachings in the church that we've and that is like what David just said we're, we're missing people don't have that they just think the Catholic Church teaches a bunch of rules but personalism provides that deep underlying explanation that makes people say oh I want to be happy so I want to live according to this that that's what I think the, the personalist vision does um, and maybe one last thing we've been talking about God a lot so we've been combining philosophy and theology. And I just think God as a person, as we saw in the beautiful presentation by Anne there, um, he can forgive anything, no matter how bad it is. In other words, people, have, people are so lost right now that if you bring this vision, they might be overwhelmed by it. And that is why I think it's also good we talk about the divine person who just wants nothing more than to forgive us and actually can make all things new um no matter what we've done so that's what i think the personalist vision is <laughs> and thank you all for a great week thanks pete uh let's see we have uh michael and rocco and john cosby would one of you like to go next i'm going to call on people calling on michael uh, okay i'll go we'll save the best for last so i'll go um uh, first of all, I just think Pete's point is really beautiful. And I know that when I taught philosophy of love and sexuality, and this doesn't count for my time, uh, that um, they would be overwhelmed by the fact that maybe they had made mistakes, but that Christ could forgive was the, was the door. So I think that point is beautiful. Now my time starts. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> I think the personalist vision, a couple of things um, are important. One that just were that we're embodied, embedded persons that I talked about were born into a family, born into a culture, born into a civilization, that, and that, that, that there's complexity and beauty. And this is such an expansive vision in the face of all the reductionism of materialism, of Darwinism, of, of this kind of uh, limited, we're, like, love is nothing but the attitude. And, it, and we all know it's wrong, but we can't really articulate it. And then you engage, you meet the personalist vision and, and Wojtyla and von Hildebrand and others, and it, it helps articulate what you knew, but you couldn't say. And, 
and that one of the things that, that's so second from that is that being is good, that matter is good, that the body is good, that marriage is good, that freedom is good, good uh, that, and that all of this is to be oriented to the truth and then also to beauty and goodness. I think this powerful element of beauty that you see as well, uh, to use a word, a line from Michael Novak, it's an awakening from nihilism that, that I think personalism does. And, and that, that you experience, you're told, you realize that you're a gift, you're given to yourself as a gift, like Voitiva talks about. And then that existentialist uh, effect is like, what does that, what does that mean? Or, or let me say that you also, I love that uh, Rabbi Gottlieb brought up C.S. Lewis. I think the same thing, that beautiful weight of glory says, you've never met a mere mortal civilizations, cultures, these are mortal, but we are called to be everlasting splendors, right? And that, that existentialist element, right? That, that like Rabbi Soloveitchik talks about, right? That there's, who, are, who is Adam and who is Adam and who is man and who is man redeemed? And what does it mean to, to live well? And I think of this beautiful, probably not so well known um, retreat by Wojtyla collected in the way to Christ, where in his talk to women, he says, in order for you to be a relationship with a man, you must first realize that you are a subject and that Jesus Christ reveals to you that you are a subject, not an object to be used. And I think that's the beauty of personalism, that it reveals to us that we are subjects, willed for our own sake, and, and again, to use Voitiu in language, we are not called to mediocrity, but to cast our nets out into the deep. And that you see in this, this vision of Voitiwa, of von Hildebrand, and that we're called to live and live really well. And even in the face of suffering, even in the face of difficulty, even in the face of pain or of oppression, um, that, that, that there's this spark that we're created in the image of God and that we're, we are subjects called to live well. And that was that is what is so striking and moving to me about personal. All right, thank you. Um, Rabbi Gottlieb, you know, we have Dr. Dr. Crosby and Rocco. Which of you would like to have the last word on the person with vision? Or which of you, I who gladly you would, the would, last would like word not to, to have the last word? Yeah. I gladly leave the last word to John. Uh, all right. the wise among us, to, uh, among us all. So it is fitting. Uh, well, I will say personalism is the conviction that um, God, uh, lives in the soul of man. And then philosophy is not so much a doctrine as an activity, the activity of entering into a living relation to the student or to other human beings, but we are professors, and to help him to uh, find the, the ultimate depth in which his conscience encounters God. This may take a long time, uh, but uh, this is the only thing that is worth the while to do. It is the only sense of our activity. And this is what we have been experiencing uh, together in these uh, days. And this is the task of phenomenology. Phenomenology complements traditional metaphysics because it helps us to find an inroad into the heart of man where being and good coincide. Christopher, you're muted. Okay. I'm muted. All right. Well, I was muted. asking John Crosby to unmute him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite okay. Uh -huh. John, I, I, I think we're, I think we're good. This is, you. is it my turn, Christopher? It is your turn. Oh, very good. Uh, I would call attention to an aspect of personalism that uh, came up every now and then this year, but it was front and center in the summer seminar last year. And uh, it's perhaps worthwhile here to knit the two summer seminars together. Uh, I'm referring to the place of the heart in the human person. Uh, Max Shaler announced uh, a rehabilitation of the heart. 
in his uh, philosophy. Dietrich von Hildebrand picked up uh, and was deeply inspired by Scheler's attempt to recover the heart and to see that in the human person, there are not just the power of intellect and the power of will, but in addition, this third thing, this center of affective life uh, or the heart. It, uh, I was thinking uh, just, just the other day, we were having at mass readings from Genesis about the patriarch Joseph. And <clears throat> I was thinking of the unforgettable scene of Joseph revealing himself to his brothers and the, the sobs of Joseph. And what depth of humanity lies in those sobs of Joseph. What an impoverished thing it would have been if he had engaged only his intellect and will in revealing himself to his brothers. So this plenitude, this deep personal plenitude that is uh, engaged in, uh, in the heart and the promptings of the heart, that's fundamental to all personalism. You know, when I was finishing my book on the personalism of Newman, I was surveying the parts of it, and I was myself surprised to see that every aspect of Newman's personalism was some aspect of the heart, of affectivity. You know how Newman uh, famously says, I do not deny the real force of arguments and proof of a God, but these do not warm me. They do not enlighten me. They do not take away the winter of my desolation. They do not make the buds unfold and the leaves grow within me and my moral being rejoice. So Newman expresses his aspiration for heart knowledge, for a knowledge of God that reaches into and, and awakens the human heart. And that, it seems to me, uh, is fundamental. The old, an older rationalistic model which featured primarily reason, uh, that doesn't do justice to the person. And all personalists, I think, are jealous for uh, the heart and to give it its due and its place in the life of the person. So I would just add that to all that's been already said so well uh, about personalism. John, um, we are we are nearing the end of our time here. In fact, we're actually past the end of our time, but I'm just going to go ahead and assume the charity and letting us go a few minutes over uh, because we've yet to hear uh, from John Henry Crosby. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now, uh, not, not with the question, but uh, just to, to, to wrap us up and, and, and send us on our way as we're, we're now at the end of our conference here, our seminar. Yes. <clears throat> well, yes, this is the, um, this is always the, the saddest part of all of our summer seminars, which is that they, they do unfortunately come to an end. It's even more painful when we're together and we have to go our separate ways. But um, you know, just seeing uh, the speakers here, our, our, our faculty, um, and of course, I see all of these wonderful names. Many of you I know, many of you I don't know uh, yet. Um, it's been, uh, it's really, this really has been an experience, certainly for me and for my colleagues of, of um, philosophizing with friends exploring questions with friends. So I'm, I'm simply so grateful for your time and for your participation. And I look forward to um, uh, welcoming you back. Uh, if, if all goes well, Deo Volente, uh, we will be back in person uh, next summer uh, at our, our usual summer seminar at, at Franciscan University of Steubenville. But I know that there are many of you here who uh, are, are simply too far away to join us and know that we uh, we fully intend to continue offering um, our our seminar. It's not quite sure what, what it will be, whether it would be the, probably probably it would be some kind of standalone seminar so that we can really in, engage with you, those of you who are not with us. Uh, but we certainly intend to continue uh, offering um, this kind of intellectual community virtually. Um, you know, uh, all of us here are aware of and have spoken about the, the challenges of technology and the perhaps the the inherent uh, uh, tendencies towards a kind of depersonalization or anonymity, but uh, we try here at the Hildebrand Project to personalize uh, the internet, to personalize Zoom, and uh, and to create 
as strong a sense of community as we can. So, so I wanna thank our faculty in particular, uh, those of you who've been joining us from far away, Rocco, and we've lost Joseph now, but you all have been joining us late in the evening, uh, particularly for the afternoon sessions. I'm, I'm, I'm just so grateful. And of course, to all of our faculty right here, the, this is not the, com the complete faculty, but to see, I see here, of course, Mark Spencer, wonderful presentations and Mark Gottlieb, uh, a joy to have you with us. I know Mark has been in the middle of another seminar uh, involved at the TICPA fund where he's um, uh, leads many important programs. And so thank you for joining us. David Walsh, it's been great to have you with us. That you're, you're a first time participant in the summer seminar, but we've gained so much from your contributions and we look forward to having you back for more. Uh, and Pete Pelosi, uh, a longtime friend, uh, someone who's devoted himself so much to the, the work, the study of personalism and the practical um, doing things inspired by personalism in the, particularly the medical and bioethics space. It's such significant work. Jim Beauregard, it's wonderful to be, have you with us. Uh, Jim is a, uh, a friend of, I suppose the last few years, but you've become quite a, a collaborator with the Hildebrand Project. And so I'm very grateful uh, to you. And Michael, Michael Miller, you always bring spirit and, uh, and personality and a good laugh, uh, even to serious conversations. So I don't know what we would do without you. So thank you for, for joining. And I wanna acknowledge particularly those of you who are associated scholars here, Mark Spencer, Peter Pelosi, Jim Beauregard, Mark Gottlieb, I was, I was get, yeah. getting to him. Yeah. <laughs> ending, ending with the best. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, Michael Miller, a longtime member of our board. For, for all of your years of service. And uh, I, I should express my thanks to Christopher and also to Catherine, who's not on camera now, but Catherine, of course, is, um, spoke yesterday and has, um, you all have interacted with Catherine. Catherine has brought so much to the uh, quality of the presentation that we've had here. So I thank her. Um, as, as, I, as, I, as I wind down here, it's important also to thank uh, those who are, not, for the most part, not with us, our benefactors who make these gatherings possible. Um, it may seem in the era of Zoom that a Zoom call is just someone's time and nothing more, but that's, that's not true at all. There's a tremendous amount of preparation that goes into putting something like this together. Um, and certainly when these events take place in person, there's, there's even more. Um, and we, we just wouldn't be here, but for uh, many ben benefactors, but also in particular, a handful of those who really stand behind us and make the whole Hildebrand project go. So I want to thank and at least acknowledge them, though they're not with us now for the most part. I've seen some of them come and go through our list of participants. So if any one of you happens to be here, I do see a couple, I won't name you by name, um, but uh, thank you to those of you who are on the call, you know who you are. Um, and finally, uh, an invitation to all of you to join us uh, as the project moves forward. And that means much more than just supporting us financially. Um, the participation itself, is a form of support because uh, our work is nothing if we don't reach all of you and uh, bring the uh, personalist vision into the world through our collaboration with you as, as attendees. There are, um, uh, of course, other programs that you can participate in, our reading groups, for example, which take place throughout the year. Um, then there is the, the, the word of mouth element that Christopher is very keen on spreading the word by, of course, buying our books and always buy two copies or three copies. I think that's the number we're up to now, Christopher, to give to your friends. Um, nothing like a book to change someone's life. Uh, and we continue to produce and have always more and more publications coming out. Please share those with others. Um, make other people aware of the Hildebrand Project. Sometimes we get an email introduction from one of you introducing us to a, a friend um, who they think uh, might be interested in what we do. Don't, don't shy away from that. We're not such a big organization that we're unreachable. Uh, there are people on the other side of the Hildebrand Project. You're looking at us. Uh, connect your, your friends, uh, your academic mentors, really anyone that you think would, would connect with the Hildebrand Project. You know, feel free to introduce them either to us personally or simply to the organization. And of course, lastly, those of you who are able to support us uh, financially, that's it's it's, it's always an open invitation that we, we invite you all. I know that um, particularly among students and, and academics there, uh, you know, the checks may not have as many zeros as we need. 
Um, but there are many ways of supporting us. Uh, a, a significant form of support that's growing for us all the time is monthly support. And we have people who support the organization on a very small scale monthly. Um, but we're very, we, we are as moved. In fact, in some ways we are more moved and more touched and more grateful for those small acts of support because of course they often reflect a whole reservoir of gratitude and commitment to the work that we're doing. So there really is indeed no gift that is too small, but as I always hasten to say, there's no gift that's too large. Uh, so if someone on here just has a few extra zeros that they just feel this incredible comp compulsion to add to the donation, we, we, of course, um, we of course welcome that. So uh, uh, you'll be hearing from us uh, in the, I think even later today uh, uh, with a little bit more detail on how you can collaborate with us and support us. I think Catherine has put the link into the uh, chat as well uh, for supporting the organization. Ultimately, um, support us with your prayers, support us with your with your moral support, support us with your participation in what we do. That's the most significant way all of you uh, can support us. And on that note, I, I simply thank you all for joining us for uh, this summer seminar. And I look forward to welcoming you back next year. And of course, some of you along the way uh, as the project continues to promote the personal station. So thank you so much. God bless you all. And until soon. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much.